Good morning. I'm Congressman Richie Torres, and I serve as the Vice Chair of the House Homeland Security Committee under the leadership of Chair Benny Thompson. I am deeply grateful to Congressman Josh Geithheimer for generously hosting us in his district and for his visible and vocal leadership in combating anti-Semitism. Although I am not Jewish myself, I've been a consistent voice against anti-Semitism from the moment I entered Congress and even well before then. For me, the reason is simple. Combating anti-Semitism is not and should never be the sole responsibility of the Jewish community. It is a moral obligation that should bind, bind all of us, but especially those of us in the United States Congress. The House Homeland Security Committee has jurisdiction over the nonprofit security grant program, which has emerged as a vital tool for protecting the Jewish community from violent extremism. In a properly functioning society, there would be no need for a nonprofit security program. There would be no need for schools and synagogues to be heavily protected by security barriers and security cameras and security guards. There would be no need for students in the innocence of their youth or congregants in their place of worship to undergo active shooter training. The tragic necessity of the nonprofit security grant program is a sign of the troubling times we live in and the troubled souls who increasingly live among us. The United States is confronting an unprecedented crisis of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitic violence and vandalism have risen to levels not seen in decades. About 30% of all anti-Semitic incidents in the United States in 2021 were concentrated in New York and New Jersey. Just last week, Rutgers University's chapter of Alpha Epsilon Pi, a Jewish fraternity, fell victim to vandalism during Rosh Hashanah. In an age of online radicalization, violent extremism commands the largest microphone it has ever known in human history, a platform that history's most vicious and violent demagogues could only dream of. In May of 2021, for example, the Anti-Defamation League, ADL, found the hashtag Hitler was right trending on Twitter with tens of thousands of retweets and with no content moderation in sight. In the summer of 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia, during the Unite the Right rally, white supremacists were found uttering the words, quote, the Jews will not replace us, in an odious reference to the great replacement theory. And most tragically, on October 27, 2018, a white supremacist motivated by replacement theory entered the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and opened fire murdering 11 Jews in the deadliest act of anti-Semitism in U.S. history. Although white supremacist extremism has historically been a dominant driver of anti-Semitism, it is far from the only one. In early April of 2022, in New York City, following a wave of terrorism in Israel that left multiple Israelis dead, a set of activists in a rally entitled Globalize the Intifada took to the streets of New York and publicly called for Zionists to be purged from college campuses and classrooms. The substitution of the word Zionist for Jew has become the modus operandi of a new insidious strain of anti-Semitism that has taken hold in college campuses and on social media platforms. Anti-Semitism is too complicated to be reduced to one cause. It can be found everywhere on the right and on the left, among the secular and among the religious. History tells us that anti-Semitism is a virus with more than one mutation, with more than a single strain. And as a virus, it has spread rapidly and widely on college campuses, on social media, and on the streets of America where it has grown not only in frequency and severity, but also in far too many places with impunity. And so we are here today to examine in greater detail why anti-Semitism has risen so suddenly and sharply, and what we in Congress can do specifically to aid state and local governments, as well as our community-based partners, in turning the tide against an ancient hatred that too often thrives on conspiracy theories and too often hardens into violence. When it comes to the fight against anti-Semitism, failure is not an option. I thank our witnesses for being here, and I look forward to an informative and productive hearing. And so with that said, uh, if the chair is present, I, the, chair, the chair recognizes the true chairman, Thompson, for opening remarks, if you may have any. 
If not, without objection, uh, I will recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer, for any opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here on the committee to Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, I want to thank the mayor and the council uh, and the leadership here in the town for welcoming us. We're very grateful for your hospitality. Uh, on behalf of New Jersey's 5th District, we're honored to be hosting the Homeland Security Committee and my colleagues. Thank you very much for being here. We're here, as I mentioned, to address the troubling rise in anti-Semitism and domestic violent extremism in, in New Jersey and nationwide. I want to thank Chairman Thompson, Vice Chair Richie Torres. Thank you very much for your excellent leadership, the witnesses today, and of course my colleagues for recognizing the importance of this issue, for bringing it front and center, and for their leadership in combating hate and anti-Semitism and extremism. Across the country, including right here in our community, there has been a dramatic spike in hate crimes targeting religious and ethnic groups and members of the LGBT community as well. For example, according to the Anti-Defamation League, who we're honored to have joining us today on the panel, the overall number of anti-Semitic incidents in New Jersey rose by 25% just last year, the most ever recorded in New Jersey by the ADL since tracking began. In fact, in a gruesome anti-Semitic attack last year here in Teaneck, a man wielding a hammer broke the windows of a pediatrician's office and dry cleaners. The bloody man confronted a mother and daughter asking if they were Jewish. This is just one of 70 reported anti-Semitic incidents here in Bergen County last year alone, the highest in all of New Jersey. And just last week, the Jewish fraternity, which I belong to as well, Alpha Epsilon Pi at Rutgers University, was once again vandalized, this time during the high holiday of Rosh Hashanah. This is the second time in just one calendar year. Unfortunately, nationally, the ADL's audit of anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. recorded 2,717 acts of assault, vandalism, and harassment in 2021, an average of more than seven incidents every day. That's why I'm working to ensure we're keeping North Jersey's house of worship, synagogues, temples, and religious schools safe. I'm proud to have helped these organizations claw back more than $8 million in nonprofit security grants to North Jersey while I've been in office, the most out of any district. We've also experienced a rise in anti-Asian hate crime since the pandemic, especially here in North Jersey. In fact, the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism found that anti-Asian hate crime increased by 339% last year compared to the year before. I know the rise of racially charged attacks against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community has many no longer feeling safe. I hear stories of residents having to carry pepper spray around town and fear of letting their children go out to play. This shouldn't be the new normal. As we are seeing a rise in extremism and hate crimes across the country, it's critical that we take steps to invest in, not to fund, law enforcement. We must keep our families and our communities safe as well as our police. That's why I introduced a new bipartisan bicameral bill, the Invest to Protect Act, which I'm glad to have co-sponsors of on this committee, which just passed the House with overwhelming bipartisan support to ensure that local police departments across our country have what they need to recruit and retain good officers, to provide necessary training, and to invest in providing mental health resources for our officers. I'm also introducing today the Bipartisan FASTER Act, the Freezing Assets of Suspected Terrorists and Enemy Recruits Act, along with Republican Brian Fitzpatrick, to help law enforcement freeze the assets of ISIS-inspired lone wolf terrorists or other domestic extremists that are arrested on U.S. soil. We simply can't run the risk of funds being utilized by an ISIS-inspired terrorist or domestic extremist to carry out another attack, whether that's at Ground Zero, a shooting in Jersey City targeting the Jewish community, in temples, at schools, or on the West Side Highway, where a terror truck took the life of our own community's Jimmy Drake. According to our FBI field office, these terror threats remain their number one concern. And Mr. Drake, who lost his life and his family, have been heroic in standing up for their son. The Fast Track will also implement a one-of-a-kind, state-of-the-art, national homegrown terrorist incident clearinghouse for all levels of law enforcement to collect and share information on incidents of ISIS-inspired, homegrown, lone wolf terrorism and violent domestic extremism. We know there's also been a huge spike of extremist chatter online via social media, including attempts to recruit Americans into their small cells. Over the last year, we're also witnessing an alarming spike in activity from domestic extremist groups threatening our communities with violence and hate, in person, online, and deep in our communities. We regularly hear the names of domestic terrorist groups like the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys because of their involvement in the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. In fact, today, the trial is beginning of Oath Keepers leader Stuart Rhodes and several of associates for seditious conspiracy for their role in attempting to overthrow the government on January 6th. Several of those who attacked law enforcement, the Capitol and our country on January 6th, have been arrested here in New Jersey, including a few miles from here in Sussex County, which is also in my district. And the Oath Keepers not only attacked the Capitol, 
but according to their own members, are also Holocaust deniers. Rioters on January 6th were even seen wearing anti-Semitic imagery. This is not a new issue here in New Jersey, where the New Jersey Department of Homeland Security, whose director is here, has been tracking and taking action against these domestic extremist groups for years now, including the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, and Proud Boys. They track their anti-Semitic, anti-Asian, anti-Muslim activity, and anti-American sentiment. The department then works with local law enforcement by sharing this information to combat these threats. Unfortunately, their extreme actions and radical ideas go beyond January 6th. These domestic terrorists have seeped into our communities, putting our families in danger, pitting our neighbors against one another, and further dividing our great country. Community partners, law enforcement, and experts are vital to addressing and understanding these, these threats, which is why I'm so thankful for our witnesses for joining us today. I look forward to hearing from them about how we can work together to combat violent extremism, global and domestic terrorism, and anti-Semitic threats. We must combat all forms of hate wherever it exists and ensure our communities and law enforcement have the resources they need to stay safe and secure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of course. Other members of the committee are reminded that under the committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. Members are also reminded that the committee will operate according to the guidelines laid out by the chairman and ranking member in their February 3rd, 2021 colloquy regarding remote procedures. Um, I will now welcome our witnesses. Ms. Lori Duran was appointed as the director of the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness on February 14, 2022. In her role, she serves as the federally designated Homeland Security Advisor to the Governor and is the Cabinet-level executive responsible for coordinating and leading New Jersey's counterterrorism, cybersecurity, and emergency preparedness efforts. Ms. Duran previously served as the Director of the Intelligence and Operations Division after retiring from the Central Intelligence Agency after 32 years of service. Mr. Scott Richmond is the Director for ADL's largest regional office covering New York, and New Jersey, I would say the two greatest states, uh, although I love Texas. <laughs> he oversees the work of the region, which includes in incident response, anti-bias education, legislative initiatives, and fundraising and leadership development, all designed to fight anti-Semitism and combat hate in all its forms. Ms. Susan Cork is the director of the Southern Poverty Law Center Intelligence Project. At the SPLC, Ms. Cork leads a team of investigators, analysts, and writers who track and expose the activities of hate groups and other extremists, including neo-Nazi groups. Mr. Ken Stern is the director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. Mr. Stern is an award-winning author and attorney and was most recently executive director of the Justice and Karen Kieran Rosenberg Foundation. Before that, he was the director of the Division on Anti-Semitism and Extremism at the American Jewish Committee, where he worked for 25 years. Rabbi Esther Reed is the Interim Executive Director of the Rutgers Hillel. Rabbi Reed has served as the Director there for the last 21 years. The Rutgers Hillel is the gateway to Jewish life at Rutgers University, providing every Jewish student at Rutgers University a sense of people, place, and pride. And finally, Ms. Holly Huffnagel serves as the U.S. Director for Combating Anti-Semitism for the American Jewish Committee. In this role, she is responsible for leading AJC's response to anti-Semitism in the United States and its efforts to better protect the Jewish community. Ms. Huffnagel has also overseen AJC's international relations in all projects and programs related to monitoring and combating anti-Semitism. Without objection, the witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. The chair recognizes Ms. Duran to summarize her statement for five minutes. Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Katko, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness leads and coordinates the state's counterterrorism, cybersecurity, and resiliency efforts. While an evolving threat landscape has presented New Jersey with a diverse set of security challenges, we work in coordination with law enforcement partners to address our shared domestic security. We have seen a recent uptick in domestic violent and extreme activity around the country. OHSP's analytical capabilities have concentrated on domestic extremism and the threat it presents. Our 2022 threat assessment designated homegrown violent extremists and white racially motivated extremists as high-level threats and forecasted that foreign terrorist organizations will continue to seek opportunities to inspire extremists to conduct attacks. Domestic extremists employ similar attack methods, recruitment strategies, and propaganda distribution. These elements coupled with the availability of social media, create unique security challenges. 
Racially motivated extremists remain committed to spreading anti-Semitic rhetoric online with a focus on alternative social media and encrypted messaging platforms. Nationwide, supporters of the white racially motivated extremist ideology have demonstrated their willingness and capability to coordinate and network globally, as well as to direct and inspire sympathizers online. In New Jersey, white racially motivated extremists primarily use propaganda distribution for conversion and recruitment purposes. Additionally, they may attempt to establish stronger ties in the state while stockpiling weapons and tactical equipment. Black racially motivated extremists may engage in low-level criminal activities, demonize law enforcement, and spread anti-Semitic conspiracies, while lone offenders may conduct isolated attacks. In 2019, two individuals espousing anti-Semitic and anti-law enforcement views with fringe affiliations to black racially motivated extremist ideology shot and killed a total of four people in two separate incidents in Jersey City, New Jersey, to include Detective Joseph Seals and victims inside a kosher grocery store. Although the investigation is ongoing, this past April, a lone offender was charged with attempting to kill and cause injuries to three after allegedly targeting the Orthodox Jewish community during several violent attacks in and around Lakewood, New Jersey. Both occurrences are examples of individuals driven by hate and bias, singling out and terrorizing a community. While we cannot stop every attack, we can mitigate the risks. We can build resiliency, educate the public, promote information sharing among our partners, and identify and forewarn of potential threats to the best of our ability. With the support of our state's administration and leadership, we proudly embrace a whole of community approach to security. Our Interfaith Advisory Council continues to be a national model for faith-based community engagement, with members regularly updated on best practices and security resources to assist them in identifying security gaps. OHSP serves as a state administrative agency to nonprofits that are seeking grant funding and can demonstrate a high risk for terrorist attacks. To address these vulnerabilities, over the past year, we provided these organizations with $32 million from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and $6.9 million since 2019 from the New Jersey Nonprofit Security Grant Program, a previous pilot that Governor Phil Murphy made permanent just this past January. As the public continues to be our first line of defense in the fight against terrorism, OHSP has partnered with DHS to counter violent extremism by amplifying the If You See Something, Say Something campaign messaging and by participating along, alongside selected security partner agency personnel in the National Threat Evaluation and Reporting Master Trainer Program. This program certifies homeland security professionals in behavioral threat assessment techniques to assist in identifying, investigating, assessing, and managing potential threats of targeted violence regardless of motive. OHSP is also collaborating with our partners on a behavioral threat assessment management team to deter violent extremists from radicalizing, inspiring, or recruiting individuals and to stop the mobilization towards violence. Furthermore, OHSP works closely with the state's Division of Criminal Justice, as well as county and local partners, to review bias incident reports, which are assessed to determine if they meet the threshold for submission to the state's suspicious activity reporting system. Conversely, OHSP shares all suspicious activity information and a weekly report outlining suspicious activity that may have a potential bias motivation with the state, uh, state's Office of the Attorney General and DCJ. This ensures that the proper authorities thoroughly review, vet, and investigate all incidents. OHSP aims to utilize these different initiatives to better understand and combat the evolving threat landscape. The nation as a whole has witnessed substantial changes in recent years and the threats that come from violent extremism and terrorism are no exception. These threats emphasize the continued need for resiliency and OHSP's important, important mission as we continue to meet these security challenges in collaboration with our partners. Chairman Tom Thompson, Ranking Member Katko, and distinguished members of the committee, I thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions and yield back to the chairman. The chair recognizes Mr. Richmond to summarize the statement for five minutes. Vice Chairman Torres, members of the committee, it is an honor to appear before you today to address the threat that anti-Semitism, hate, and extremism pose to New Jersey and the nation. For more than a century, ADL has worked to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. Our experts track and respond to hate and extremism from across the ideological spectrum, and we work with community partners, law enforcement, and policymakers to address these threats head on. 
ADL sees this moment as an inflection point. Hate and extremism are metastasizing, threatening our communities and democratic institutions. Amidst this rising hate, the Jewish community continues to be a primary target. ADL's audit of anti-Semitic incidents reached its highest recorded number ever in 2021, with 2,717 anti-Semitic incidents in the United States. Known extremist groups or individuals motivated by extremist ideology were responsible for one out of every five of those incidents. Locally, New York led the nation with 416 anti-Semitic incidents in 2021. New Jersey came in a close second with 370, the highest number ever recorded in the state. Of the 21 counties in New Jersey, Bergen County, where we are today, had the highest number. These troubling trends have continued this year, from harassment to violence to hateful content online. In April, my office worked closely with the Lakewood community and the county prosecutor following a series of violent attacks that culminated in the stabbing of an Orthodox Jewish man. Anti-Semitism lurks across the political spectrum. Radical anti-Israel and anti-Zionist sentiment drive incidents across this country. I want to be clear, criticism of Israel is not by itself anti-Semitic. However, efforts to delegitimize and demonize the Jewish state often rise to that level. Last year in New Jersey, ADL recorded 27 anti-Semitic incidents motivated by anti-Israel sentiment, a 35% jump from the year before. The uptick in anti-Semitism goes hand in hand with rising extremism across the country, as ADL research has shown. Recently, the Goyim Defense League distributed its hate-filled content in New Jersey, blaming Jews for spreading COVID, having too much power, and threatening the open, quote, white race, close quote. White supremacist groups cloak themselves in feigned legitimacy with innocuous sounding names like the New Jersey European Heritage Association, which was responsible for one third of the white supremacist propaganda in New Jersey last year, while online platforms <laughs> enable and amplify their reach. Such hate yields deadly results most recently in Buffalo, where a gunman espousing white supremacist and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories killed 10 people. I was among the first on the scene supporting our local partners, including the National Urban League and law enforcement, and continued by working with state leadership to combat domestic extremism. Together, we can and must do more to prevent future tragedies. ADL has repeatedly called for a whole of government, whole of society approach to curb the rising tide of hate. I call on Congress to adopt ADL strategies, the combat plan to fight anti-Semitism, the protect plan to mitigate extremism, and the repair plan to, to curtail online hate. I would like to highlight seven key recommendations. One, prioritize and promote efforts to counter violent extremism as well as oversight and transparency for those efforts. Two, establish an interagency task force to combat anti-Semitism. Three, adopt the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism as a guideline for understanding anti-Semitism and identifying its modern day manifestations. Four, legislate to end the complicity of social media companies. Five, create an independent clearinghouse to identify extremist content. Six, continue to fund and grow programs that protect marginalized communities like the nonprofit security grant program. And finally, seven, ensure that the measures announced at the White House summit, United We Stand, which ADL supported, are implemented in full. Last week, I helped at Rosh Hashanah services at my synagogue. As part of my duties, I was designated to wear a panic button around my neck to alert law enforcement in an emergency. Like so many worshipers, I spent the service distracted by the fear that our synagogue could be next, the next Colleyville, the next Jersey City, the next Tree of Life. As Yom Kippur begins tomorrow, I urge you to remember the way that these threats tear at the fabric of our communities, our democracy, and our country. Now, now is the time for action. Thank you for your attention to this critical issue, and I look forward to your questions. The chair recognizes Mr. Stern to summarize his statement for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, Vice Chair, Torres, Ranking Member Katko, Representative Gothheimer, and the Honorable Members of this Committee. In my written testimony, I described how hate against others, seen as unrelated to anti-Semitism, actually helps create a climate where anti-Semitism can grow and how increased understanding of hate is a prerequisite for effectively combating anti-Semitism. 
The attack on the Tree of Life synagogue was an act of anti-Semitism, but no one classifies the murder of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans at the El Paso Walmart months later as an act of anti-Semitism. But if you look at the ideology of the two shooters, they were almost identical. They just picked different targets. Imagine you're a white supremacist fearful of demographic changes. How can superior people be losing to their inferiors? Someone must be putting their fingers on the scale, and that's where Jews come in. Anti-Semitism throughout history is a belief that Jews conspire to harm non-Jews, and it provides an, an explanation for what goes wrong in the world. Anti-Semitism gets more traction when democratic norms are threatened, endangering more than just Jews. The 1990s militias took anti-Semitic tropes and repurposed them to vilify federal employees. And once people are sucked into a system of conspiratorial thinking, they will inevitably be exposed to anti-Semitic ideas. Conspiratorial thinking is more mainstream today than in the 1990s. And frankly, I'm less concerned today about what leaders may be saying about Jews and more about what they may be saying about immigrants and Muslims. When people are primed to divide others in this country into us and them, it's inevitable that anti-Semitism will grow. Brain science, social psychology, and other fields demonstrate that we are hardwired, or at least pre-wired, to see in us and in them. And when perceived threats to our identities are tethered to issues of justice or injustice, we feel more comfortable with certainty and complexity and are drawn to binaries, us versus them, good versus evil. I have four recommendations from hate studies, three of which I'll discuss briefly. First, as a society, we calculate the cost of many things, potholes even. But what does hate cost us? We plan to publish an economic analysis approximating the cost of hate crime as a first step in this inquiry, but it would be much more impactful if as a regular part of the government reporting of hate crime statistics, it also included data drawn from the particular incidents, not only to document the costs, but also to illustrate them in real human relatable terms. Second, how do we make anti-Semitism anti and anti-Semitic violence less likely, especially in a country that's so divided? There's a social psychology study called the Robbers Cave Experiment. Two groups of boys from very similar backgrounds went to a summer camp. Each group didn't know that the other existed, but then they were exposed to each other in a competitive environment. They not only had animosity, but acted on it. Later, they had to cooperate to fix the camp's water supply. That superordinate goal, or perhaps the creation of a larger group identity, helped reduce the hate. I was inspired by Colin Powell, who suggested a program of national service, and I've long wondered, what if we took high school seniors from different backgrounds and sent them on a common public service mission? How about a Latinx person from Texas and a Jewish person from New York and a black person from LA and sent them together to work for an organization that builds homes for American Indian people in South Dakota, for example. Bring people together from different groups, have them interact with each other and form a new group identity, and having them together help someone else might, and I stress might, make them less likely to be drawn into the us versus them thinking that threatens our democracy and increases the potential for anti-Semitic and other types of hate crimes. Finally, when late, the late uh, Robert Hess, the president of Brooklyn College, faced an incident that threatened to tear his campus into tribal groups, his message was, we're all members of the Brooklyn College family. We are all thus and us. Part of our center's work is to give practical guidance to help communities reject appeals of actors who want to target those amongst us as a them. We recently co-published a community guide for opposing hate. It's a notes and bolts manual about what to do in the aftermath of a hate crime or anti-Semitic threats. We stress the importance of working in partnership with political leadership, and I can't overemphasize in our divided country how important it is for leaders to underscore that we're all human beings breathing the same air. One way to beat back the acceptance of the idea that we have to be protected from a nefarious them is to find as many ways possible to expand the us. So finally, I ask that we all find as many ways possible to stress the equivalent of Bob Hess's refrain. We're all human beings, all part of this great nation, each of whom has an equal right to be part of the social contract in our democracy. The more we expand the us, the less likely there will be tax on our neighbors, Jews included, because they are seen as a death. 
Thank you. The chair recognizes Ms. Quark to summarize her statement for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, Vice Chairman Torres, and honorable members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today for this important hearing, which comes at a precarious time for American democracy. I am Susan Cork, Director of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Intelligence Project. There's been a disturbing rise in anti-Semitic incidents in New Jersey and elsewhere in the country. This uptick in hate-fueled activity is part of a larger hard-right movement that stokes the fires of anti-Semitism, promoting racism, fear, and extremist violence. Anti-Semitism, in addition to being a toxic form of prejudice, is also an animating feature of white nationalist ideology. And it's often a leading indicator that a society is more broadly infected and divided by racism. Established in 1971, the SPLC has been tireless in finding and rooting out hate and extremist groups to create a more fair, inclusive, and unified nation. The Intelligence Project, which I directed SPLC, has deep expertise in monitoring and exposing, as well as countering, the activities of hundreds of domestic hate groups and other extremists across the country, including the Ku Klux Klan, the neo-Nazi movement, anti-government militias, and others. White supremacy has gone mainstream, which increasingly threatens people of color, our communities, our education system, and democracy itself. The Great Replacement narrative has become mainstream on the political right over the past few years. This racist conspiracy, which says there's a systematic global effort to replace white European people with non-white foreign populations, provides the central framework rooted in anti-Semitic ideology for the white supremacist movement. The theory has motivated many deadly terror attacks. Having lived in New Jersey with my multiracial family, I can attest that New Jersey exhibits some of the most incredible benefits of living in a multiracial democracy. However, it was anti-Semitism which fueled a December 2019 deadly shooting at a Jewish market in Jersey City, New Jersey, where I was living at the time. I want to urge the committee to focus on the need to invest more in the prevention of radicalization. We want to stop hate crimes before they are committed and build stronger, more resilient communities. My written statement provides details on some of the 26 hate and anti-government groups SPLC tracked in New Jersey in 2021, which includes a statewide chapter of the Proud Boys, as well as other notorious hate groups on the hard right, including Patriot Front, the Oath Keepers, as well as the New Jersey European Heritage Association. SPLC has been closely tracking the anti-government, heavily armed extremist Oath Keepers group. There are multiple Oath Keeper chapters in New Jersey from Morriston to Cape May. The Oath Keeper leaders consistently pushed for a second civil war in the build-up to January 6. Several of the Oath Keepers are currently on trial for seditious conspiracy. The Oath Keepers organization is in some disarray as it faces justice. However, more than 40 members of the violent Proud Boys also face charges in relation to January 6 alleged activities, including at least two men from New Jersey. Yet the influence of the Proud Boys has grown, not waned. The number of active Proud Boys chapters increased almost 67% between 2020 and 2021. We at SPLC strongly believe that all who helped plan, finance, inspire, and perpetrate the deadly January 6 account attack must be held accountable. Without such accountability, our democracy will continue to be at risk while false and nefarious attacks on our elections, on voting rights, and the diversity that makes us strong. What can we do? My written statement includes many policy recommendations. I will summarize five. One, expand anti-racism education and upstream prevention initiatives. We must bolter, bolster community well-being and work to inoculate young people against radicalization. To do that, we must increase funding for prevention and anti-racism education initiatives. Two, speak out against hate, political violence, and extremism. Words matter. It is impossible to overstate the importance of hearings like today with leaders condemning hate and extremism. Three, enforce hate crime laws already on the books and improve hate crime data collection efforts. After 30 years of incomplete data and underreporting, 
we should support mandatory hate crimes reporting. Four, improve government response to domestic extremism and fund digital literacy initiatives and evidence-based prevention programs. Five, promote online safety and hold the tech and social media companies accountable. Thank you so much for holding this hearing today. We deeply appreciate the committee's attention to the issue and we stand ready to work with you as you continue to focus on this important issue. I'm happy to answer your questions and yield back to the chairman. Thank you. The chair recognizes Rabbi Reed to summarize her statement for five minutes. My name is Rabbi Esther Reed and I am the executive director of Rutgers Hillel, a Hillel serving one of the largest Jewish undergraduate populations on any campus in North America. Hillel International is the world's largest Jewish student organization with a presence on more than 850 campuses. On behalf of the Global Hillel Movement and Rutgers Hillel here in New Jersey, thank you for the opportunity to feature your testimony and for your commitment to countering anti-Semitism. Hillel was founded 99 years ago, and for the first time in recent memory, Jewish students feel unsafe and unwelcome at their own school. I'm here today to share with you what's happening on campus and to make two requests. We urge continued security funding for religious institutions and enhance enforcement. We want to make sure you're heard. Uh, let, no, let's we'll st restart the clock. Restart the clock. Yeah. Start all over again. Uh, up to you, but you'll you'll we'll have your time restored. Okay, I'm here today to share with you what's happening on campus and to make two requests. We urge continued security funding for religious institutions and enhanced enforcement of the Department of Education's responsibility to protect the rights of Jewish students. Anti-Semitism on campus has risen to unprecedented levels. Hillel tracked 561 incidents of hate against Jewish students last year, a 15% increase from the previous year, and more than triple the number of incidents four years ago. This hatred comes in the form of graffiti, physical assault, social media rhetoric, and the social exclusion of Jewish students. At Rutgers New Brunswick alone, A.E. Pi, a Jewish fraternity, was egged two years in a row while students were participating in the solemn 24-hour memorial practice of reading aloud names of Holocaust victims on Holocaust Memorial Day, as well as on the major Jewish holiday, Rosh Hashanah, one week ago today. The tires of Jewish students, their cars, were slashed. White supremacist groups posted anti-Semitic recruitment flyers on campus. My student, Ben, who wears a kippah or yarmulke on his head, was afraid to go to his internship in Jersey City the day a kosher grocery store was shot up there. Eggs thrown at a fraternity don't make international headlines. Slash tires don't make the evening news. A college student staying home from his internship isn't usually on the agenda of a congressional meeting. But nobody wants Rutgers to be the next headline. Nobody wants Rutgers to be the home to the next tragedy like the ones the Jewish community faced at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the shooting in Poway, or the hostage taking in the Colleyville Synagogue to, in Texas. We need your help to stay out of the headlines. First, I wanna thank you as members of Congress for appropriating funds for the security needs of religious institutions. This year, Hillel's received grants totaling $1.9 million for physical security enhancements. These nonprofit security grant program funds make a concrete difference in the security and safety of my students. Rutgers Hillel installed bollards in front of our building to protect, protect us from a car and prevent a car from ramming through and harming Jewish students. We installed new fencing at the back of our facility to prevent intruders. We don't want our institutions and facilities to be ringed with security devices, but sadly, they have to be. The Jewish community needs more funding to keep us safe, and we urge the committee to be vigilant in ensuring that the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights will investigate, address, and enforce violations of the federal civil rights of Jewish students. There are dozens of pending cases involving allegations of anti-Semitism under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, including an action filed against Rutgers University in 
2011. Many of the other pending complaints are also over a year old and have yet to be investigated. Every week that goes by is another example of Jewish student rights to each equal opportunity not being protected. On behalf of my students, I appreciate the committee's vigilance in ensuring the Department of Education carries out its responsibilities under Title VI. I will leave you now with the words of my student, Adina, a student at Rutgers Newark. Jewish students there tell me that they keep their heads down and they hide their Jewish identities so that they can avoid trouble. Adina says this. Every day I am stressed about going to school. Every single morning I need to think about things when getting ready for school. Am I dressed too Jewish? Do I look too Jewish? Does my shirt have any Hebrew on it? I can't wear something if it says Israel on it. It has become a habit that as I leave the parking deck, I check to make sure that my necklace is inside my shirt. Jewish students like Adina should not have to tuck in their Jewish star when they're heading to class. No student should be afraid to express their Jewish identity in New Jersey in 2022. Again, I thank you for the opportunity, for keeping my students safe, and for your leadership on this vital issue. Thank you. Ms. Huffnagel, five minutes. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chairman Torres, for the introduction. Uh, Chairman Thompson and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for convening today's hearing and for offering American Jewish Committee this opportunity. I'm Holly Huffnagel, AJC's U.S. Director for Combating Anti-Semitism, and it's an honor to be with you today and with our esteemed witnesses. Given the limited time, I won't summarize what is happening or why anti-Semitism is rising although I have provided those explanations in my submitted written remarks. Instead, I wanna focus on prevention. How can we go beyond simply responding to anti-Semitism, but actively work to prevent it? And I wanna list 10 measures, which I pulled from AJC's recently published call to action against anti-Semitism in America. And the first, to prevent anti-Semitism, understand the problem. 34% of Americans today are not familiar with anti-Semitism. They've either never heard the word before or they've heard it but don't know what it means. So to ensure that anti-Semitism is properly understood, Congress should reintroduce and pass the Bipartisan Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. Second, to prevent anti-Semitism, engage the Jewish community. 36% of Americans don't know someone who's Jewish, but Americans who do, are, significant, are significantly more likely to know what anti-Semitism is, know that it's a problem, and know that it's increasing. And Congress can lead here in helping constituents understand anti-Semitism as well as who Jews are. And they can convene stakeholders, including law enforcement, to discuss anti-Semitism and hate crimes. The third, to prevent anti-Semitism, invest in Jewish community security. 56% of Jewish institutions have increased security between 2018 and 2020. Congress plays a crucial role in safeguarding these institutions through legislation and funding. Fourth, to prevent anti-Semitism, be prepared for the patterns. We know anti-Semitism often rises during election cycles, around Jewish holidays, and during flare-ups in the Middle East. And government leaders and law enforcement should be on alert during these times and provide support to the Jewish community as needed. Fifth, to prevent anti-Semitism, gather better data, including hate crime reporting. States, including New Jersey, should consider creating a task force to study and prevent anti-Semitism. We also need improved hate crime reporting from law enforcement. Nearly 90% of cities do not report hate crime data to the FBI. And the 2021 Jabara Hire No Hate Act establishes grants to incentivize reporting, but it needs to be funded. Only once funded will local governments, including those in New Jersey, be able to leverage Department of Justice resources. Six, to prevent anti-Semitism, issue unequivocal condemnations. Grouping anti-Semitism with a long list of other hatreds and bigotry when it was only the Jewish community attacked, it's unhelpful and even hurtful. And we just saw this exact response from Rutgers University when it was just a Jewish fraternity house that was vandalized. 
Congress can lead here and call out anti-Semitism unambiguously. Seven, depoliticize the fight against anti-Semitism. Instead, participate in bipartisan caucuses and coalitions to combat anti-Semitism and hate. Eight, urge the White House to create a national action plan to combat anti-Semitism. Only through collaborative efforts of all facets of government will we be able to achieve unity of effort towards addressing the problem. Number nine, fund educational initiatives. The importance of education and prevention can't be overstated. While programs to combat racism and intolerance provide an important framework, they may downplay or ignore the problem of anti-Semitism. Because of its complexity, anti-Semitism should be addressed as a unique form of hatred. And 10th and finally, to prevent anti-Semitism, stop its proliferation online. The digitization of anti-Jewish prejudice has been the leading contributor to its rise in the last decade. And lawmakers from both sides of the aisle can hold social media companies liable for content on their platforms if their algorithmic amplification leads to offline violence or harm. To conclude, it is much more challenging to discuss prevention than to discuss and to discuss what's actually working. But we know better data shining a flashlight on the issue has worked. We know trainings on anti-Semitism within DEI spaces has worked as we've seen policies change. We know pushing on social media companies has worked. We, we still have a long way to go, but we're much farther now than we were five to seven years ago. We know that coalition building has worked, especially since behavioral science shows that people change when information comes from someone they know and someone they trust. And that might not always be the Jewish community, which is why having non-Jewish allies is so paramount. And we know that fostering Jewish pride, Jewish life, being proudly Jewish, it works. And when these interventions are used together, we notice a difference and we see glimpses of success which is why having the House Homeland Security Committee take on and champion these preventative measures right now is so critical in New Jersey and across the United States. Thank you for your commitment to this issue and I look forward to your questions. I thank the witnesses for their testimony. I will remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the witnesses. I will now recognize myself for questions. Um, and I'll start with ADL, you know, outside the state of Israel, the United States is home to the largest Jewish population in the world. Um, the United States has historically been seen as a sanctuary for Jews fleeing oppression and, and persecution elsewhere. Has America lost its reputation as a safe space for Jews? I wouldn't say that America has lost its reputation as a safe space for Jews. Uh, this is a, a country that, that has rule of law and democracy and uh, is, a, is a place where, where Jews have found a, a home, but it is in trouble. Uh, there are troubling signs, and of course not just for the Jewish community, where the Jewish community does not live in a vacuum. Uh, the hate is on the rise against many marginalized communities, including the Jewish community. Uh, this is not a matter of uh, whether or not the United States has lost its way. It's a question of... Uh, of recalibration. So uh, our plans, our combat plan for combating anti-Semitism, our protect plan for uh, fighting extremism, and our repair plan for mitigating online hate are ways to approach that. You know, I worry about the radicalizing trajectory of American politics. You know, Richard Hofstadter famously wrote about the paranoid style in American politics. And as American politics becomes more paranoid, there's reason to think that it will become more anti-Semitic. Uh, and so I'm curious to know, what does January 6 tell us about the relationship between extremism in general and anti-Semitism in particular? Among the insurrectionists who invaded the U.S. Capitol were Oath Keepers and white nationalists and Holocaust deniers. So what does it tell us about the relationship between the two? There's obviously a close relationship between extremism and anti-Semitism. Uh, January 6th shows us certainly a, a degradation of, of democracy. It also shows us the increasing polarization in our country. Polarization has been a huge driver of anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, with regard to your question about uh, extremism, we've seen uh, an enormous rise in not just extremism, but in extremists becoming more, extremist rhetoric becoming more mainstream extremists becoming more emboldened, and that has led to anti-Semitism. And perhaps here in New Jersey, we can cite some figures related to that. White supremacist propaganda, 
uh, is a, a, a big and growing problem. ADL began tracking white supremacist propaganda. We're talking about flyering and stickering and banner drops in communities. We began tracking this in 2017. In 2017, there were 12 incidents of white supremacist propaganda in New Jersey. Last year, there were 179 such incidents of white supremacist propaganda. That's an enormous rise. It not only speaks to the rise of extremism, but it speaks to how emboldened extremists have become. I, I want to touch on what has been a subject of controversy, which is the relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Um, there are some people who deny that there is such a relationship, but there have been growing attempts to institutionalize BDS on college campuses. On September 28th, the Jewish Journal reported that nine student groups at the University of California Berkeley School of Law amended their bylaws to ban pro-Israel or Zionist speakers. Um, surveys indicate that the overwhelming majority of the Jewish community identifies as pro-Israel. And so if a student association adopts a policy that has the real-world effect of excluding most of the Jewish community, is it fair to see that as an example of how anti-Zionism and policy could morph into anti-Semitism in practice? And I'll direct that to the rabbi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just making sure. There's no question, uh, as Mr. Richmond said earlier, that it's possible to criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic. But what we see time and time again is that criticism of Israel can be anti-Semitic. And so when you make a blanket statement that someone who's a Zionist is not permitted to be part of a group, which we see on college campuses across the country, that's anti-Semitism. Uh, Mr. Torres, as you just said, the majority of the Jewish community identifies as Zionist, even though we're also proud Americans. We believe that Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish state within safe and secure borders, and we can argue about what those borders are, we can argue about the details, but we believe that there is the right for Israel to exist as a Jewish state, and therefore by saying that Zionists are excluded, you are excluding the majority of Jews in the United States when you make those policies. And a question for ADL on the same topic. In May and June of 2021, I think we saw the amplification of anti-Zionism on social media taken to a new extreme. And so what impact, if any, did the anti-Zionist words and ideas circulating on social media have on anti-Semitic incidents in the real world? In May and June of 2021, following the Israel-Hamas conflict, ADL saw more than a 100% increase in anti-Semitic incidents year over year, so obviously had a very, uh, very tangible real-world impact, uh, including right here in New Jersey, where we saw a 35% increase in anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Israel anti-Semitic incidents in, uh, in this state. So what happens on social media does not stay on social media. That is correct. I see my time has expired, so I will now recognize Mr. Green for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank Chairperson Thompson for having the wisdom and foresight and being absolutely judicious in providing us this forum. Mr. Chairman and colleagues, the great poet Emily Dickinson reminds us that a word is dead when it is said, some say. I say it just begins to live that day. Words have power. Words cause actions. Words must be appropriate. And when they're not, and they're anti-Semitic, we have to condemn those who would utter such words. I have a special relationship with the Jewish community because I know my history. I know who Arthur and Joel Spengarn are. I know their relationship with the NAACP. I was president of the Houston branch for about a decade. I know why the NAACP has a medal styled the Spingarn Medal. So I have a special relationship. I believe people of color have a special relationship because of the way we've had to combat these invidious forms of discrimination through the decades. So today I just want to make one point. Hopefully I'll make it 
perspicuously clear. And that point has to do with a statement that's been recently made. A former president of the United States of America has recently called or indicated that the majority leader in the Senate had a death wish when he supported legislation sponsored by Democrats. That's inciting. That can cause harm. The majority leader shouldn't have a former president say such a thing. No one can be above our criticism. We cannot allow people to simply because they have had a title or they hold a title to escape the truth associated with the harm words can cause. This former president went on to say that his wife, he referred to her as Coco Chow, she was born in Taiwan. That's a racist statement. That's a racist statement from a former president of the United States. Same president who said there's some very fine people among the biggest races in Charlottesville. Same president who said that there are S-hole countries in Africa. If we allow any one of us to become exempt from the criticism that we will direct to many of us, most of us, then we do our country a disservice. I'm 75 years old. I know what racism looks like. I know what anti-Semitism looks like. As a child, I had to drink from colored water fountains. I had to sit in the back of the bus, balcony of the movie. I understand what we're up against, friends. And I am pledging my support for any legislation that we produce to fight anti-Semitism. Finally this, Dr. King reminds us that at some point, or there comes a time was more appropriately the way he said it, when silence becomes betrayal. We all have a duty to speak up regardless as to who the perpetrator is, and especially if it emanates from the highest office in the land. So my question is simply this, have we said enough about the incited comments that have emanated from the former president? And I would beg anyone who would desire to answer to do so. Fear not, dear brothers and sisters, fear not. ADL, as a 501c3 organization, uh, is not uh, permitted to, to comment on individuals in that way. But I would say that using your bully pulpit, uh, leaders using their bully pulpit, is a critical tool in combating anti-Semitism, in combating hate, in combating extremism. And I, I certainly urge the members to do that. Uh, ADL uses its voice very vigorously, and most certainly uh, if you look at our commentary on what the former president said uh, uh, yesterday that you made, re the, the reference you made uh, with regard to, um, to Ms. Chow, um, ADL spoke out very vigorously about that. Rabbi? I also work for a 501c3 nonprofit organization, but I would say that we need to call out hatred wherever we see it, whether that's on campus or off campus with our elected officials or anyone else in a position of leadership, um, people in the entertainment industry. There are people in lots of different areas who, uh, who get a lot of attention, and when they say something hateful, it's our responsibility to speak out. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me. The chair now recognizes for five minutes the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can. Very good. Well, I want to begin by thanking our witnesses for the testimony today. I want to thank the committee for holding this very important hearing. Uh, we all know, clearly see the rise of anti-Semitism 
and clearly the, the best disinfectant to uh, way to combat uh, anti-Semitism is to sunlight and, and accountability, call it out and, and speak out against it wherever and wherever we see it. So uh, this hearing uh, is more to light is very important. Uh, Mr. Richmond, I can start with you. Um, in your testimony, you laid out uh, a policy framework and recommendation for a whole of government approach to uh, fight uh, anti-Semitism, uh, prevent uh, terror, uh, domestic uh, violent extremism, and, uh, and push uh, hate and uh, extremism back to the fringes uh, of the, the digital world. In looking um, across uh, the, the range of recommendations, uh, present in the ABL's Combat, Protect, and Repair uh, plans, are the measures that, that in your view, would be of, of greatest benefit uh, or uh, particularly urgent and should therefore be priority for Congress to act on? I would, um, thank you for the question, I would reiterate the, uh, the points that were made because those I, I think are particularly critical. Uh, prioritizing and promoting efforts to counter violent extremism as well as oversight and transparency for those efforts, establishing an interagency task force to combat anti-Semitism, adopting the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism as a guideline, and I, I stress that as a guideline for understanding anti-Semitism and identifying its modern day manifestations, legislating to end the complicity of social media companies, creating an independent clearinghouse to identify online extremist content, continue to fund and grow programs that protect marginalized communities like the Nonprofit Security Grant Program, and ensuring that the measures announced at the White House United We Stand Summit are implemented in full. Uh, and I would add uh, a couple of other points uh, to that that I think are, are relevant um, since you're asking the question. Um, and certainly using uh, uh, one's bully pulpit is, uh, is a critical tool, uh, as was mentioned before. Also, supporting the CP3 office, uh, including authorizing its work to ensure the government supports prevention efforts. I know that Congressman Yanowski has been active on that. Uh, supporting education efforts, including online literacy. Uh, ADL has been at the forefront of anti-bias, anti-hate, anti-bullying education across the country. Uh, more than four million students are touched every year by those programs. Uh, and, um, and of course, with regard to social media, uh, holding them accountable for the proliferation of content. Uh, here I, I point to uh, AB 587, that's the assembly bill in, um, uh, in uh, California that was just passed, to hold social media companies accountable. That's of course at the state level, uh, but that uh, that type of legislation, I think, should be looked at uh, and possibly implemented nationwide. Uh, we have uh, uh, our combat plan, our protect plan, uh, and our repair plan, copies of that available for all of the members to look at in detail. Uh, there's much more to it. I've only outlined some of the recommendations. Very good. Very helpful suggestion. Thank you for that. Um, if I could turn now to uh, Professor Storm. Anti-Semitism, it was fucked up uh, by the anti-Semitism on college campuses. Um, uh, clearly, anti-Semitism is becoming more and more um, uh, common, unfortunately, on, common, uh, on college campuses. But can you help the committee uh, fully understand what has caused this sort of anti-Semitism uh, um, in, in academic settings and how universities should respond? Uh, well, th thank you for that question. Um, to put things into context, there are about 4,000 college campuses in the U.S., and the EDL statistics show that there were 155 campus anti-Semitic uh, anti incidents, in, uh, of which 24 were related to Zionism in Israel. And in my uh, recent book, I, I noted there were 149 campuses with anti-Israel activity. So, in the context, it's a very small number, as disturbing as the individual incidents are, as we heard from Rabbi Reed. And if you look at the data, we're also there are twice as many pro-Israel activities on campus each year than anti-Israel. But that said, there's a challenge. And some chances anti-Semitism, as we heard, comes into play, holding Jewish students collectively responsible for Israel, using anti-Semitic tropes, cutting and pasting Israel as a Jew. Where it's difficult is this. I'm a Zionist, and I find anti-Zionism disheartening. 
but I think it's wrong to say that all anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And it's, in my view, harmful to impose definitions of anti-Semitism on campus, like the IRA definition, which was used for different purposes. And we can't ignore that it's been used to chill pro-Palestinian speech, um, which is, I think, why the Association of Jewish Studies president uh, testified against the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. So with that context, let me give quick six quick suggestions of what schools should do. First, tackling anti-Semitism should require an understanding of the institution's principles. They should always support ideas of academic freedom. I'll have to explain them away. Second, let's not forget that this battle is happening in an environment where students will be encouraged to seek out safe spaces, microaggressions, and trigger warnings. Um, and there's a difference between being harassed and intimidated and shut down, which should never happen, having to engage you know, with difficult uh, ideas. And I think that's an important thing to uh, focus on two. Third, there needs to be an increase uh, in opportunities for emotional empathy to tell students what they would feel like if they were in a Jewish student's position or Palestinian uh, student's position and courses that do that. Fourth, we need more. The gentleman's time has expired. So. Oh, okay. Yep. okay. And I, the Thank chair will now recognize uh, Congressman Gottheimer for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in 2021, the Southern Poverty Law Center documented 1,221 hate and anti-government extremist groups across the United States, including anti-Semitic and neo-Nazi groups in New Jersey. During the January 6th committee hearings this summer, Jason von Tottenhoff, a former spokesman for the Oath Keepers, testified that his breaking point with the group was learning that the group were Holocaust deniers. Riders wearing anti-Semitic imagery were present on the day of the January 6th attack. Uh, I'll start actually with Mr. Richmond. Um, can you talk a little further about the beliefs, ideology of the members of groups like the Oath Keepers, and do they align with Mr. Uh, Van Tottenhove's uh, testimony, and uh, do these groups pose a threat to the Jewish community? If you, I could start with you. Uh, certainly groups like uh, the Oath Keepers uh, and the Proud Boys, and, uh, and now, now these are not white supremacist groups. And so these are, these are far-right groups, nationalist groups, militarist groups. Uh, we could add to that white supremacist groups like the American Identity Movement, the White, white Lives Matter Movement, uh, New Jersey European Heritage Association, the Goyim Defense League. Uh, all of those pose a, uh, a threat to the Jewish community. All have espoused anti-Semitic rhetoric. Uh, some of them uh, more than others, like the Goyim Defense League, which focuses its, its venom specifically on the Jewish community. Um, uh, but uh, the, um, all, all of those groups are, are focused um, on, uh, on extremism, uh, use extremist methods, uh, are, uh, are lashing out at uh, many groups, not just the Jewish community, um, with, uh, with vigorous forms of hate. You, you um, in your report, uh, that you put out in 2021 on Oath Keeper membership, data revealed that politicians and elected officials, including here in New Jersey, had signed up for an Oath Keeper's membership. Can you tell us a little bit more about the findings in this report and why you think public officials are aligning with the Oath Keepers? Uh, what are their ties to anti-Semitism? And Director Duran, I'll ask you to add to that. And what, what are, now how, how have groups like Proud Boys and Three Percenters and Oath Keepers presented a threat to local law enforcement? So if you can start first, Ms. Richmond. So uh, in uh, about a year ago, uh, a journalist collective had uncovered 38,000 names of people who had signed up to be members of the Oath Keepers. ADL analyzed that list uh, painstakingly over the course of a year. Uh, we analyzed it for, uh, f to, to, to find people in position of leadership uh, or influence, like those in the military, like those in police forces, teachers, um, elected officials with ties to the Oath Keepers. Uh, we discovered that uh, quite a number of people were, uh, were connected to, uh, to those different positions of, uh, of leadership, uh, including 10 police chiefs, uh, including those who are in office, those are running for, uh, who are running for office around the country, uh, which of course is very, very troubling because of the, uh, the uh, extremist rhetoric that the Oath Keepers what do you has. What do you make of that tie? Why do, why do you think they are joining groups like the Oath Keepers? Perhaps they believe in the, uh, uh, in the, um, the stance of the Oath Keepers, uh, which is anti-government. Uh, they are a, uh, a group that believes in militarism. They target specifically those in the military and in law enforcement. Uh, that's been the pattern of the Oath Keepers. 
Uh, Mr. Rand, do you want to, Mr. Rand, do you want to comment a little more on that, Director, about the groups like the Proud Boys and Three Percenters, Oath Keepers, the kind of threats they're presenting that you see in the state thank, to law thank enforcement? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, first, let me just state right up front that OHSP does not classify groups or organizations as extremists. We recognize the First Amendment protected rights and activities. And we also do not monitor violent or potentially violent incidents and assess, assesses strategic and tactical tens, ten, trends among multiple different domestic ideologies. With that said, we do, you know, we are aware of what's going on in the news, and, but we um, basically are looking at it at analytical purposes, but we don't look at groups specifically. Right, but you've tracked extremists before. We have tracked ideologies related to that and, are, you know, and look at public information to see what's going on there and then use that in, as part of our analysis. Are you concerned about these growing threats in our state? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, last question, if I can turn to the rabbi. Uh, when we talked about Rutgers before uh, and the, the significant spike uh, in New Jersey of anti-Semitic comments and vandalism and harassment. Um, can I ask you a quick question? Do you believe it's appropriate for a state university such as Rutgers to invite anti-Semitic groups such as Democracy for the Arab World Now, Dawn, which has ties to Al-Qaeda and Hamas networks to campus, and then apologize for, for those groups? Uh, I guess I would need clarification when you say Rutgers University invites. Every registered student organization has freedom at Rutgers University to bring speakers that they're interested in, be, in, in, in having speak. So if a registered student organization brings a speaker, then that's the right of that registered student organization. Hillel can bring a speaker that other groups disagree with. Um, and uh, if it's a university department, that might be more complicated, although there is academic freedom as well. So it's a very complicated issue. I certainly feel that it's incumbent on university leadership to speak out whenever there's hatred on campus, whether that's in the form of an invited guest or a member of the university community. The administration needs to speak out when incidents happen, as they did not speak out when uh, AEPI was egged last they week. They didn't make any comments, the university. The university spokesperson made a statement. There has not been any st statement from the administration themselves. Have you reached out to the administration? Yes. Thank you. I guess I'm over. I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is this on? It's hard to yeah. tell. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I, I wanted to focus some of my questions on the, the role of social media, and, and um, I, I think the, the larger point I would make to, to start this off is that none of what we are discussing today is new. Anti-Semitism is not new. Extremism is not new. Conspiracy theories are not new. Uh, QAnon, for example, is just the modern version of the ancient anti-Semitic blood libel um, in, in very modern uh, online form. Um, what is new is the, the speed with which these hateful ideas spread and I think the growing weakness of traditional institutions um, encountering them. Um, and I do think one of the central reasons for this is that we all get our information, all of us get our information about the outside world today filtered through social media platforms, whatever the original source of that information is. And if anti-Semitism and hatred is a virus, Facebook is the wind, and it's designed to be the wind. It's literally consciously designed to amplify information and content that triggers hateful, fearful, insecure emotions among um, its users because those emotions are what drive engagement, um, time spent on platform and ultimately advertising revenue. Um, Mr. Richmond, you, you refer to some of this in your testimony. I wonder if maybe you could elaborate on ADL's views uh, on that problem and the solution, and we'll take it from there. So certainly you're correct that uh, the social media platforms are designed to, uh, to amplify these messages uh, through their algorithms. Uh, ADL's repair plan uh, tries to, uh, to address this with uh, a multifaceted approach to, uh, uh, to focusing on hate online. Uh, and I, I think I would recommend uh, a, few, uh, a few points here. Um, from the perspective of, uh, of the members, um, uh, instituting public-facing community guidelines that address hateful content and harassing behavior is, uh, is critically important. 
regularly evaluating and publicly reporting on how social media platforms fuel discrimination, bias, and hate, and then making product or policy improvements based upon those uh, evaluations are important. I mentioned AB 587. That's a, a California Assembly bill that, that was just signed by Governor Newsom, which requires social media companies to report to the legislature how they are uh, addressing hate misinformation online. Uh, very important, ADL worked closely with legislators in the state of California on that issue. Uh, work with communities targeted by harassment uh, to design product features and policies that will reduce the influence and impact of hate in ways most helpful to those directly targeted. Uh, ADL has its Center for Technology and Society uh, that is focusing on this issue. Uh, and is making these recommendations, and, and uh, the Center for Technology and Society and ADL as a whole looks forward to being your partner in helping to implement some of these recommendations. Understood. Um, and I think ADL has also recommended to that, that, that Congress move forward a bill that I co-sponsored, the <laughs> Protecting Americans from Dangerous Algorithms Act, which would waive some of the protections of Section 230. Um, with respect to social media algorithms if they are responsible for real-world violence, um, attacks like the attack on January uh, 6th. Um, Ms. Huffnagel, maybe I could turn to you because I know that your organization has also been championing legislation uh, uh, like this and maybe I'll give you the chance to make uh, a few remarks about it. Thank you. Uh, we also supported the, the bill to uh, against uh, Protecting Americans Against Dangerous Algorithms Act, and that's very important actually in this in this time because it's no longer a, a free public space where these idea like the best ideas will rise forward. We know these algorithms are actually promoting the worst ideas, the anti-Semitic ideas, and that's why we're seeing this off these offline reverberations. I think one of the most important things that we're realizing in our work at American Jewish Committee, and we do work with Twitter, we work with TikTok, we work with Meta, we work with uh, you know, YouTube, is there is a lack of realization of the complexity of anti-Semitism. Only certain elements of anti-Semitism are defined on the platforms, and, and that speech comes off. And that's often the most violent. But the danger is the conspiratorial anti-Semitism, or when the word Zionist is used as a proxy for Jews. That has a free pass. We can just look at Ayatollah Khomeini's Twitter account and just see anti-Semitism just with the word Zionism or Zionist in its place. And it has reached beyond you know, any reach that we'll be able to have. And so this is what we're seeing. And if we don't tamp down on the anti-Semitism and how it's defined and how employees within the companies understand anti-Semitism, we're not going to be successful in removing it from the platforms. Well, I, I would just, just say in conclusion, I, the, the, the tech companies have created literally the perfect machine for spreading hatred. Um, if I post, if I'm on the left or the right and I post something anti-Semitic on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, the, the algorithm automatically calculates, knowing almost everything about everyone in the world, who in the world is most susceptible to that message and connects me to that person, connects my message to that person. Never before in human history have we had such a machine. And if we don't do something about that, there's nothing that can be done with Section 230 because you cannot hold them liable. You cannot sue them. J federal judges have correctly thrown out lawsuits brought by victims of terrorism against Facebook because Section 230 prohibits them from hearing the lawsuit. They have begged us, in their opinions, to address this problem in legislation. I hope that this Congress, and if not this Congress, the next one, will take this up. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, we will proceed to a second round of questioning. I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Um, I have a question for Ms. Cork regarding hate crimes reporting. I know at one point um, not every state and local government reported hate crimes to the federal government, and the majority of those that did reported no hate crimes, uh, which strikes me as implausible. So has there been an improvement in the state of hate crime reporting to the federal government? Ms. Cork? Thank you for the question. Um, no, I would say after 30 years of incomplete data and uh, underreporting, um, this continues to be a serious problem. Um, one thing SPLC has been recommending is that uh, we would like to see Congress and the administration support mandatory hate crime reporting. Um, until there's legislation to require 
um, reporting, which can you know include incentives, more carrots and sticks. Um, it needs to be a condition that's uh, precedent to receiving federal funds. Um, as you know, it has been a consistent problem year over year. Um, it stretches plausibility that cities as big as you know Newark, for example, can be reporting few to no hate crimes. Um, and as we know, good good research and data is what makes for good policy. Um, so we would strongly support uh, increased attention from Congress to um, improving hate crime reporting. Great. I have a question for the rabbi. Um, an organization entitled Stop Anti-Semitism came out with a assessment of 25 universities and colleges, uh, the climate of anti-Semitism in each of those colleges. Only two received the perfect score, Tulane and Brandeis. Uh, Rutgers received a C minus. Does is that comport with your experience? So um, I, I will say that in my um, 21 years being at Rutgers University, unfortunately there has been a significant number of anti-Semitic incidents. In the last two years alone, I have a list here of 40 separate incidents in the last two years. That's a lot for Jewish students on campus to have to deal with. Um, and that does not include the unreported incidents, like um, when someone's walking by a visibly Jewish student and says under their breath, effing Jew. The student doesn't report that to the authorities. That's not listed in the ADL statistics. It just is part of the life of a Jewish student. And um, a Jewish freshman was harassed by their non-Jewish roommate when they put Hanukkah decorations up on the door of their joint dorm room. And when the student reported it to Residence Life, Residence Life considered it to be a roommate dispute and had the Jewish student move to a different room in a different dorm where they had to make new friends. The student came to see me um, in Hillel. He had never been to Hillel before. And this is an 18-year-old boy who came to me crying because of how he had been mistreated by his anti-Semitic roommate. So yes, I think that there are issues that our students face on campus all the time. And in terms of how it affects our students, many of them, especially if they come from um, not such a strong Jewish education, not such a strong Jewish background, they just want to hide their identity and make it all go away. They would want to... Um, so in some sense, Jewish students have to be in the closet. They, yes. There are Jewish students who are closeted. They don't want to be targeted. Yeah. And um, they are exhausted from constantly having to defend themselves or defend the actions of a country miles and miles away, you know, that, that defend the actions of the state of Israel that they have no responsibility for. I have a question for Mr. Richmond. Um, in an article that went viral in Tablet, it had a provocative title, It's Open Season on Jews in New York. The author Armin Rosen brought to light a shocking statistic. 118 adults have been arrested for anti-Semitic hate crimes in New York City since 2018, yet only one has been convicted and imprisoned. Only one. I know in your role you speak frequently to leaders in the Jewish community, to victims of anti-Semitic hate crimes. Have victims of anti-Semitic hate crimes lost confidence in the ability of the criminal justice system to secure justice on their behalf? And if so, what is that crisis of confidence? What impact does that have on the reporting of hate crimes? The report that you mentioned, uh, that, that report came out this past July. Uh, ADL is, uh, has reason to believe that there are factual inaccuracies there. We've spoken with uh, law enforcement. We work very closely with law enforcement. We work very closely with the DA's office who have indicated many uh, inaccuracies in that report. I do not believe that uh, the people have lost faith in, uh, uh, in this, the issue of hate crimes, in the, in the ability of, of hate crimes uh, uh, laws to, uh, to protect people. I would also say that just because a person is not ultimately convicted of a hate crime, and that's of course not an issue for ADL, we're not law enforcement, we're not prosecutors, a lot of nuance that goes into that. Just because a person is not uh, ultimately prosecuted for a hate crime does not mean that the law does not take their case seriously and does not mean that that person uh, is not um, being held to account for their crime. Um, hate crimes will, will simply elevate the level of uh, uh, from a class C to a class B felony, for example. So I, I just want to, before I move on, uh, are you 
fundament is the ADL fundamentally satisfied with efforts to prevent police and prosecute anti-Semitic hate crimes? There's always more that can be done, uh, but we do believe that that law enforcement and uh, uh, and the district attorneys are working uh, vigorously to prosecute hate crimes. My time has expired, so I'm going. I will now recognize Mr. Payne if you're available for five minutes. I'll now recognize Mr. Green for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> we have um, indicated today, in fact, that it's necessary for us to stand up for others. Speak out. Have courage. Mr. McConnell and I don't agree on very much but I'm gonna stand up for him. My failure to stand up for him would be a failure to stand up for myself. I'm gonna stand up for his wife, former Transportation Secretary Chow. So to this extent, I have a question for um, Ms. Cork with the Southern Poverty Law Center. The comments that I styled incitive, how can those comments adversely impact a response uh, to Mr. McConnell or his wife. I'm sorry, to, to restate the question, um, standing up for Mr. McConnell and his wife, how does that? Mr. McConnell and his wife, uh, you probably, I assume you're aware that the former president has said that Mr. McConnell ha had a death wish for supporting certain legislation mm -hmm. and called his wife um, Coco Chow, which is a racist comment. The death wish comment is incitive, and I'm asking your opinion as to how this can adversely impact them or others. That, that is reprehensible. And to be for um, somebody like the former President Trump to be using his platform to be trying to intimidate a member of Congress um, and his wife, who has been a long time public servant, using racial stereotypes and threatening violence over social media, um, the, the danger and the impact of that is incredibly alarming. Um, and it is a legacy of um, from the Trump administration and why we are seeing the normalization of this kind of uh, rhetoric. There's a greater acceptance of the use of poli politically violent rhetoric like this. Um, from President Trump on down um, to other political leaders as well as what's normalized on Fox News, uh, SPLC has tracked that there is a much higher degree of political uh, acceptance of political violence amongst the Amer American public now the mainstreaming of these racist, violent ideas um, is an increasing problem in our country. And therefore, I, I condemn um, Trump's use of this language and to be threatening a, a member of Congress is just beyond the pale. Thank you. Permit me to ask this, uh, friends, to anyone who would care to respond. When we fail to denounce persons who hold high office, is that, is that something that is more of a failure than to denounce a person who is uh, on the street and happens to say something? Does it take on an even greater meaning when it's said by someone who holds a high office. Rabbi, what do you think? Uh, as a rabbi, I am uh, in the spotlight and uh, certainly able to be criticized. Um, I joke with when I'm driving down College Avenue in New Brunswick where the main Rutgers campus is, when students are walking across the street looking at their phones, not paying attention to the fact that I'm driving, 
Um, I'm always afraid that, God forbid, should I actually hit them. The headline would say, Rabbi hits college student, as opposed to me as an individual. I do think that people who have leadership positions are recognized because of their leadership positions, and that when someone in a leadership position or even in a former leadership position does something wrong, says something wrong, acts inappropriately, that we do call them to task, not only because what they did was reprehensible, but because also because of the stature that they currently held or once held. My time has expired. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, cha the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, uh, Mr. Gottheimer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since 9-11, Americans have been aware of the threat to the homeland presented by terrorist organizations overseas in a way that we hadn't. <laughs> Uh, foreign terrorism remains an ongoing concern to our safety. Uh, the January 6th attack on the Capitol provided a stark reminder that dangerous, violent extremist groups are present right here in our own country. These groups, as we talked about, are Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, um, Patriot Front, to name some of the well-known ones. And I mentioned earlier the trial of Oath Keepers leader Stuart Rhodes and several other members present at the Capitol on January 6th starts today. Uh, Ms. Cork, if I can sp ask you a question, as of 2021, there were reportedly 3,800 hate incidents targeting the AAPI community nationally. How are these extremist groups targeting this community specifically, and what can we do to better address these threats? Thank you. I really appreciate that question. And um, you're correct, there's been an alarming rise in um, disturbing, discriminatory, and violent incidents um, against people of Asian American and Pacific Islander backgrounds. Um, you know, we saw uh, close to the SPLC offices um, a little over a year ago, the um, violent tragedy um, targeted against Asian American women um, at the spa. And that is a particular intersection that we see the intersection between um, misogyny, male supremacy, and um, violence directed towards people of the AAPI community. Um, I, I deeply appreciate your question about what, what can we do um, because SPLC has been very much focused on the, the greater need for prevention, that once it becomes a hate crime, it's already too late. So we very much appreciate the administration's summit and the commitment of additional resources, a billion dollars going to Department of Education, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Humanities, because preventing these in incidents for the in the longer term requires a much greater um, commitment and investment to prevention of radicalization. We at SPLC um, have been working on a series of resources for parents, educators, caregivers to understand um, how radicalization happens, to see the warning signs and have the tools to intervene effectively. Um, that's the type of resource that we believe um, should be more widely available to parents and caregivers, um, as well as digital literacy. SPLC has the Learning for Justice program, um, which has a number of resources available on digital literacy. Um, and, you know, building up community resilience. So the... the um, right. and, and this is just to jump in there, I, just to jump in there, because I think this is related as well. We've seen recent situations involving a neo-Nazi white nationalism group, Patriot Front, targeting the LGBTQ community. And I think it's related to, obviously, your, your broader efforts um, to make sure we stand up to it. Why, why do you what are we seeing here from the goals of this group in particular as well? Yeah, the, um, the Proud Boys have shifted their strategy. So they felt very empowered during the Trump administration. The current strategy, which is a, a dangerous one for is that they are going after the grassroots um, and they are really trying to uh, activate and instill fear at the local levels. And we have seen an incredible uptick in anti-LGBTQ rhetoric and efforts that are, that are coming from the hard right. And that is something that we are raising alarms about because there has um, you know, been increasing violence and this is an explicit tactic of groups like the, uh, the Proud Boys to try to animate at the grassroots level to be designating LGBTQ persons, particularly trans persons, as a danger and to be mobilizing the population against it. It's an incredibly dangerous trend. Thank you very much. You know, I'm, I'm shifting gears. I'm introducing my bipartisan bill, the Fast Track, today 
which will allow law enforcement to notify financial institutions when a terrorism suspect in federal custody is in federal custody and immediately freeze their assets uh, as well as provide a national clearinghouse to collect information. Uh, Mr. Richman, um, how do you, and, and anyone can add to this, how are these hate groups financing their activities? What are you seeing? What authorities and tools do you think we should be giving our federal agencies to help cut off the financing of domestic extremists? Any, any thoughts on that? Um, well, first of all, you know, I want to thank you for your leadership on the, uh, the NDAA uh, in uh, using that to fight uh, anti-Semitism and extremism um, at, the, uh, at the DOD. Uh, and I really I would urge that they uh, um, add that to the final bill. Uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, considerations with regard to, uh, to finance, I would need to get back to you on that uh, with, uh, with additional details, but I'll, I'll be no, reaching thank out you. to your staff on that. Thank you. Anybody else before I run out of time want to comment on that, on, on the financing side? I don't know if anybody on the long line is prepared on that. If not, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes for five minutes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Malinowski. Thank you so much. Um, in my last round, I, I asked a question that I knew the answer to. I was shamelessly plugging uh, my legislation um, to save the world, so it's a good cause. But um, I, I wanted to engage you, Rabbi, on a question I actually don't know the answer to. I just want to explore with you what is, when there is a pattern such as what you described at Rutgers, um, and we've seen this at other universities, um, particularly when an argument can be made that this goes beyond students harassing other students, but that there may be some institutional discrimination. Groups registered with the campus, um, as Mr. Torres outlined, um, adopting rules that essentially discriminate against Jewish students regardless of their, their views. What is the proper role of the Justice Department um, in using its tools under civil rights legislation to push university campuses to do more and to do better? Uh, I assume you would not say the answer is nothing. I assume you would also probably agree that immediately cutting off federal funding for Rutgers University, which would deny financial aid to the very students that you, that you advocate for every single day is also not the answer. What, what is the appropriate instrument? So uh, I do feel that Jewish students have a right, equal right to education in a safe environment, just like every other kind of student has equal right to education in a safe environment, and that it's incumbent upon our government to uh, enforce that right and to protect Jewish students. I mentioned before the Department of Education's um, Title VI um, uh, legis the, there are multiple cases that are very slow to being adjudicated. Um, there are dozens of cases that have been brought on behalf of Jewish students against universities that are just sitting there, uh, including the one at Rutgers from 2011. I was there when the incident took place. I witnessed it myself, and I can't believe it's 2022 and it's, nothing's happened. So I, I think that, that it is incumbent on the government to take responsibility and to act through the proper procedures and proper channels um, when these kinds of incidents take place. Good. Well, that's uh, something that I think we should all be discussing um, a bit more because I want to make sure we do that in the right way. Um, I, I also want to um, maybe double down on some of the points that Mr. Green was making about the importance of responsible political leadership in our country. Um, we're all Democrats up here. I think that gives us a particular responsibility to condemn things like the BDS movement, which are associated with the political left. Um, it is equally appropriate for us, uh, as Mr. Green did, to call out the silence and complicity of people on the other side when leaders in their party um, engage in, well, legitimizing uh, racist ideologies. Um, dangerous anti-government ideologies in our country. Um, Ms. Mr. Stern, maybe if I could bring you into this and ask you if, 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 a, if a leading party candidate for the United States Senate in one of the most hotly contested races in the country runs an ad showing himself with an AR-15 rifle marked with a Q, mm -hmm. is that helping or hurting the fight against anti-Semitism in the United States? 
Well, thank you for that question. And also working for a college, which is a 501c3, I'm not going to say something about one particular candidate, but just generally, I think when leaders campaign on ideas that say conspiracy theories are fine, that we ought to vilify some others, that we ought to see the world as very simple and it's a problem because that secret group behind there is doing something to harm us, that inevitably uh, harms our democracy and it actually poses a threat to uh, Jews in particular because as I put my written testimony, one cannot um, go into the sewer of conspiratorial ideas without being exposed to and sometimes being animated uh, by them to see Jews as that secret force behind. So I, I think it's important to, to call that out whenever it happens. Well, let me, again, and just make, make this yes or no. I'll just throw out some, some more examples. Um, when, when leading politicians uh, use rhetoric that, um, that basically sounds like the white replacement theory, uh, accusing immigrants of being invaders to our country, uh, calling immigration a, a plot to replace um, native-born or white Americans on the voting rolls, is that something that helps or hurts? The, the cause it, of fighting anti-Semitism? It, it hurts tremendously. Um, our center gives an award for name for a, a Republican state committee woman named Beth Ricky, who showed personal courage to speak out against David Duke uh, when he was in the legislature in Louisiana. And she actually helped push back against him. I'm seeing fewer voices of courage like hers these days pushing back against these types of ideas. And I I fully agree with you. It should not just be a partisan issue. I think it's important when people that basically may agree with us on policy do things like this, we have a special obligation to speak out. Thank you. And just just a final note, I'm I'm not sure if you guys are right that being a 501c3 organization prohibits you from calling out a statement by a particular individual, Mr. Richmond, your Executive Director, Mr. Greenblatt, regularly uses his platform, I think appropriately, to respond to statements by leaders in the public space that are wrong. Um, I don't think a university professor or uh, a rabbi is somehow precluded from doing that by any federal statute, um, so long as it's done objectively in keeping with the values and principles of your organization. So um, I think we can all be a little bit more brave when we see such things. Otherwise, they're just going to continue to proliferate. Thank you. And I yield back unless somebody wants to respond to that. I would just say you're absolutely correct, and that's why I mentioned to, uh, uh, to Congressman Green that, uh, that we called out the statement that was made by the former president. Uh, we certainly call out statements. We certainly focus on issues. Uh, we won't attack an individual directly um, just as, as an individual. Um, I'll now recognize myself for. I'll now recognize myself for a third round of questioning. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to do ten rounds. No, I'm kidding. Uh, 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 Until the problem is solved. Uh, <laughs> that's how we uh, re- solve problems in Congress. Is um, I want to echo actually what what Congressman Malinowski said that obviously there's nothing new about extremism. What's new is the technology that enables it to spread to an extent and at a pace we've never seen before. And I'll add one more observation that there's a mutually reinforcing relationship between social media and mainstream media. We know replacement theory is heavy on hate. It combines anti-Semitism with nativism and racism as evidenced by the mass murder of 10 black Americans in Buffalo. Um, And the most prominent proponent of replacement theory arguably has been Tucker Carlson, uh, who is a creature of mainstream media, yet his ideas do spread virally on social media Um, I'm sure that Tucker Carlson would deny that he's anti-Semitic, but a case could be made that by promoting conspiracy theories, by promoting extremism, he is creating a climate that's far more conducive to anti-Semitism. Is that a fair assessment? We need no look uh, look no further than the uh, Tree of Life massacre in, uh, in 2018, which was fueled by the Great Replacement Theory. If we recall that synagogue, was attacked because the week before they had held a, 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 a highest Shabbat, a Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society Shabbat, 
Uh, so this particular individual who targeted the synagogue believed that uh, that, <coughs> that synagogue was promoting immigration, was promoting bringing in black and brown people to replace white people in this country. That is the great replacement theory, and, uh, and certainly we see the, uh, the results of that. Right, so to be clear, th those who traffic in conspiracy theories, who traffic in extremism in general, are inciting anti-Semitism regardless of whether you intend to do so. Is that? They are inciting anti-Semitism. They're in inciting all forms of hate against marginalized groups. Um, Mr. Stern, and if, if, I, if I misheard you earlier, um, please, I apologize, but I, I don't know if I heard correctly that you had concerns about the IRA definition. I know ADL supports the IRA definition. Did you express earlier that you had objections to or concerns about the IRA definition? Yeah, um, I think for some things it's perfectly fine. I think it's the clearest set on of rules or a guidance on looking at hate crimes because you don't have to look at somebody who really hate Jews. They selected them uh, to be a victim of a crime. But I am worried, and I testified in front of the Judiciary Committee in 2017, that it's being used on campus in a way that, to my view, harms academic freedom and an actually sort of like a black hole taking away from the other things that universities should be doing, surveying, increased classes, and so forth. And you say there's a simple thing that's a, sort of a de facto hate speech code, uh, which is how it's being seen by people. That stops academic freedom, and I think it harms Jewish students. Um, so I, I think it, it's, it, you know, to me that there's a caution about that, uh, specifically about we need things that can I, can I ask, how does it undermine but academic freedom? Because what it's doing is it's telling people that are uh, pro-Palestinian uh, that some of their comments are off the board. So if you look at the history of the Title VI litigations before the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act was um, proposed, they included things like classes that talked about uh, Palestinian rights. They included things like a program that said the creation of Israel was a tragedy for Palestinians. They talked about what was being syllabi. They talked about, um, you know, the speakers that were coming into campus. And that, to me, harms the academic enterprise. What you want to do is things like the Narrow Bridge Project at, at Brown, which has just pulled together students who are Zionist and anti-Zionist and give them the tools to have a credible discussion and figure out why we have such differences, not to say we're going to take a certain set of political ideas, political ideas I disagree with, by the way, by and large, and say that the university is putting its finger on the scale, saying those ideas uh, are, are less acceptable than other ideas. Correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I might be wrong about this, but my, you know, I was, whenever you have a definition, there are always going to be cases in the gray area. There's always going to be misapplications of any definition. But it seems to me that the purpose of the IRA definition is to recognize that there can be a relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. So in the case of the University of California at Berkeley School of Law, if you impose a blanket ban on all pro-Israel and Zionist speakers, that's the kind of policy that has anti-Semitic effects in the real world, and that's what's meant to be captured by the IRA definition. Is that your understanding of, of the workings of the let definition? Me, let, me, let me give you a parallel. Say there was a definition of racism that was going to be used on a campus, and it included political examples like opposition to affirmative action, opposition to taking down Confederate statues, opposition to Black Lives Matter. You know, would you want that as the sort of guideline on, on campus because it's political speech? I agree that Zionist students feel hurt. Um, I think that the university should try to, as, as Aaron Chemerinsky did, talk about the need for having an inclusive environment where everybody feels part of the fabric. Um, but I worry about government saying that a particular use of, of a tool is it, like this is a problem. The other thing is it's a church-state problem here. It's debate inside the Jewish community about whether to be a Zionist is required to be inside the tent. I don't know how that's going to be decided, but I sure as heck don't want government to decide it. My time has expired, so I, the, uh, the chair will now recognize for five minutes uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm uh, I'm going to ask you, Ms. Cork, the impact of referring to human beings of color 
who happened to be of Latino or Latin ancestry, referred to them as illegals, the illegals. What, what, what is the impact of doing this, in your opinion? And Rabbi, I'm, I'm coming to you next. <laughs> Thank you, you for that question. Um, th and the intent certainly is to instill fear and to define uh, those people who are seeking immigration as the other, as the enemy. It's a often used as an explicit strategy to steer, stir up fear. Um, that's the intention, and that is also the impact. Um, to be defined as other and to be um, dehumanized in such a way with that kind of language. Um, you know, hate, hate crimes and discrimination, uh, the, the harm goes beyond the initial words or the initial incident. Um, you know, there's a saying, uh, you may forget the words, but you will remember how it made you feel. Um, the impact to the community um, that identifies um, with the nationality that people are coming to this country, uh, it, it impacts that whole community um, beyond the individuals that are the target. It makes um, the broader community feel less safe, that they are um, considered lesser than. So it's very dangerous and it is divisive and it corrodes at the fabric of our democracy. We are you know, a nation of immigrants. Um, and so that kind of fear mongering rhetoric is dangerous. Thank you. Mr. Malinowski, I want to thank you for uh, broaching this issue because it's exceedingly important that we, we take a position, take a stand. It's about human beings. Their, their humanity is being assaulted and they're being put in harm's way by virtue of how they look. So we have to take a stand. A rabbi, where do you stand? Well, the Jewish tradition teaches that every human being is made in the image of God. And in that sense, each one of us has intrinsic holiness. And we all have a responsibility to take care of one another, recognize the holiness in the other person, and to uh, appreciate and respect their humanity. So calling a group of people illegals, calling them names, uh, hate mongering, causing fear that's going to cause ultimately uh, n verbal attacks lead to physical attacks. And so um, we need to prevent, by, prevent that by recognizing that we're all made in the image of God. Uh, Mr. Richmond. We're also a nation of laws and these people are here legally. They've come to us seeking uh, asylum. They've come to us uh, seeking uh, 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 to be protected. Uh, and that is enshrined in our law. We are, we are uh, obliged to, uh, to adjudicate their cases and decide what's next. So calling them illegals is not only uh, inappropriate and hate-mongering, but it's incorrect. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to respond? Uh, I don't want to appear to be overly selective. <laughs> I'd like to respond, if that's OK. Uh, Representative uh, Holly Huffman with American Jewish Committee. Please, Just coming AJC. Coming back to what you said earlier. Yes, yes. with AJC. Uh, about speaking up and speaking out, I think where we are now, two and a half years after the pandemic, this really deepening polariz polarized society is speaking up in general might not be enough. We actually, like again, that behavioral science is showing that people are going to listen to people they trust, the people they know. So democratic leaders condemning anti-Semitism on the right, like from the Proud Boys, from the Oath Keepers, etc. That's incredibly important, but it's, it might not be as effective or go as far for if, if not for Republican leaders, people they know, people they trust, people who are like them condemning it. And so I think something that we're encouraging, especially as studies have shown, like a Pew study came out last month that showed people uh, don't trust people in the other party anymore. Like about, I think it was like. Uh, 25, 30 percent of, of Americans won't even trust people if they're the opposite political party. So that's why we really need, you know, to call it out on our own side of the aisle first. And I think, you know, getting leaders and working together in that bipartisan way uh, will actually be the start, um, not just for helping Jews, but for Latinos, 
uh, for the LGBTQ community, for other communities as well. Mr. Chairman, because I won't be here for round 10, I'd just like to make <laughs> a final statement. Uh, <clears throat> dear friends, especially to my conservative friends, and I have many, this is an admonition. Your failure to speak up and speak out is putting your brand at risk because conservatism is being conflated with racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, and all of the invidious phobias. I, I would encourage you to have the courage to speak out and protect the conservative brand, which is a legitimate brand. We may differ, but I respect conservatives, and I would hope that you would remember what Emily Dickinson called to our attention. A word is dead when it is said, some say, I say it just begins to live that day. Let not these words live. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to set the record straight. We will have 20 rounds, not just 10. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, look at ideologies, not necessarily always the individuals, but we're very much concerned of, of those individuals that were here in New Jersey who were participated in the events of January 6th. And other, you've been for years tracking many of these groups. Yes, we have. In your reports. Yes, like uh, I said, we, we tend Proud to Proud Boys, more, Three Percenters, Oath mm -hmm. Keepers, and others, I know you for years have been tracking yes, them. Yes, we have. No, generally what we do is, like I said, is we look more at the ideologies, though we are obviously looking at public information when we, when we compile our data and some of how we uh, determine our statistics and uh, numbers are made very slightly differently than perhaps the ADL and other places. But yes, that's very much considered to be one of the top threats here for New Jersey, and we and stand thank, by that. Thank you so much. I yield thank back. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you. The chair recognizes for five minutes Mr. Malinowski. Thank you so much. Um, well, I, I'm glad you guys had that exchange. I, I, let me just put this bluntly. The, the Oath Keepers are an organization that recruits members of law enforcement and the United States military to make war against the United States government and our political system. I, I cannot think of anything more dangerous. That is their purpose. They talk about the U.S. Constitution. They recruit people from within our uniformed services to undermine the U.S. Constitution. They were a central part of an attempt to violently overthrow the United States government on January 6th. 2021, and we should be crystal clear about the threat that that organization poses to our way of life in the United States. As it says, everybody has a right to free speech in, in this country. Everyone has a right to express the craziest, most dangerous ideas, but when people conspire to take those kinds of actions, we can label them for what they are. Um, with that, um, let me, let me build upon Mr. Torres's questions um, earlier on about um, movements that promote conspiracy theories. Um, I think there's sort of two sides to that coin. When you look at groups like QAnon, um, they are on the one hand promoting wild conspiracy theories. On the other hand, they're also promoting mistrust for all the institutions in our society that have been set up to help people distinguish between falsehood and objective reality, right? I mean, we, we have these institutions. Nonpartisan press, for example, has played that role. People are confused about what's true, but we used to trust Walter Cronkite. When he said Richard Nixon violated the law, Republicans all across this country accepted that as the truth. There are government institutions, scientific institutions, the FDA, the Centers for Disease Control. People used to trust those institutions law enforcement institutions, the FBI. If the FBI labeled you a terrorist group, that pretty much ended the argument in the United States for, for most people. We're, we're now in a situation where there's an active movement to undermine the credibility of any of these institutions that, that helps us distinguish between what's true and what's false. Would, would you agree with that, Mr. Richmond? I think there is an active misinformation campaign for sure. Uh, and you are, of course, correct that uh, for, um, for many years, uh, traditional media played a role, a role in pushing hate to the margins of society, uh, and social media is not able to do that. Uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act enshrined the fact that that, uh, that was not going to be uh, somehow uh, curtailed in any way, legislated uh, uh, against in any way, uh, and there's freedom for that, and it's not just about a proliferation of misinformation. It's also about recruitment. Uh, it's also about uh, finding others who share your hateful ideas. Uh, there's a lot to, uh, to social media uh, that go way beyond just the information that's, uh, that's out there. And again, of course, uh, thank you very much for your uh, support of the, or your, your introduction of the Algorith Algorithmic Amplification Act, a uh, very, very important way to, uh, to control hate online. Thank you so much. Um, when people systematically try to define the media as fake news, when they systematically um, denigrate the objectivity of science, um, when they call for defunding the FBI, um, or nonpartisan institutions in our government, the deep state, and say all these deep state people need to be replaced by our people. 
that also, in a way, it's the flip side of promoting the conspiracy theories. You're, you're destroying the institutions in our society that can push back against those theories. It's, it's just as dangerous and just as conducive to anti-Semitism as putting out the blood libel, it seems to me. But for, for anybody on the panel, would you agree with that? I, I would. I mean, the ideas of conspiracy theories and so forth are much more, as I said, much more mainstream now than they were, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And, and that creates the dynamic uh, where, you know, the more people can see this as something noble to attack others. Uh, I think one of the things that we haven't mentioned today about this is that even though we're driving in media and social media people into their buckets, and we're talking about regulation, we haven't talked enough about how we can use this tool as a better way to combat hatred. And I think there are some good models out there. We have some in our uh, new guide for community groups, uh, but there are some that use turn free speech on their, its head. When people say something that's hateful, you can organize against that and have them, people donate money to things that, that haters would actually be repulsed at. So there are other models out there to be used more effectively, and I think we need to have more discussion about that too. Thank you. I yield back. Can I make one more statement? Um, I'm sorry to breach protocol, but it just came to my attention that President Jonathan Holloway of Rutgers University has released a statement during this hearing that um, condemns hatred and bigotry and uh, talks about the actions the university is taking in light of the egging of AEPI last week and the three other times that AEPI at Rutgers was targeted in the last two years. I wanted to make sure the public in the last week, yes. And how long ago was the incident? A week ago, yeah, last Monday. It took a week.